accelerate away at the pits of Le Mans, the 24-hour circuit of endurance. But then almost at once you've got a very difficult corner. It's a bit blind and you can't see far around it. Then you're accelerating again under the first Dunlop Bridge and down the hill and into the essence two very fast left and right handers. You're really using your brakes and all the road, and I mean all the road, over the white lines on both sides and right up alongside the banks. short straight before breaking again to Church Rouge. It's a very slow corner actually with a sandbank there on the left. Try and keep out of it. So now we've started on the Moulton straight. This is the real straight, although there's a kink at each end. And this is where the speeds really go up. Over 150 miles an hour now and we're not even flat out yet. And yet you can see the way the white lines flash past. Now we're getting on towards the halfway down the straight and approaching maximum speed over 200 miles an hour. It can get darn difficult here at night, particularly when you can see a couple of red lights ahead and you can't tell whether you're chasing a slow car doing, shall we say, 110 miles an hour, or a really fast one. That is, of course, unless you catch up with it. And during the 24 hours, you will break about 2,500 times. Now, this is a fast 5-litre GT car weighing over 2,000 pounds. And that means that during the race, the brakes will be running at more than 600 degrees centigrade for the whole of the 24 hours. Except, of course, during pit stops when I can tell you they get it down sight hotter than that. And now we're getting near the end of the straight. We're at full bore. And here's the right-hand curve that you take very fast, just before the braking zone. You begin to brake about 500 yards from the corner, and you start to come down from about 200 miles an hour plus to 45 or 50. The signaling area there on the right of the corner keeps in touch with the pits right through the race. Slowly round now, with a sandbank on the left. They are lucky ones, of course, each other digging themselves out. Accelerating, and now we're on the third fastest part of the circuit, before the corner they call Indianapolis. Up to about 180 miles an hour here, before breaking slightly for a couple of very fast right-hand curves leading into Indianapolis. There you can see the whiteboard at the end marking the right-hand corner. Indianapolis is two corners really, there's this small right first, which you slow for, and then you break hard for this, the main corner. Round Indianapolis, and a very short straight here, accelerating hard before breaking equally hard again for a sharp corner at Arnage. Arnage is another slow right-hander with a sandbank, which for some reason people don't seem to get in as often as the others. Out of Arnage, accelerating, building up to the second fastest part of the track, approaching 190 miles an hour. With a few of these slight curves, some people seem to lift off for them. These are the really dangerous ones, though, when you're travelling fast. The track can curve, and you don't. And somehow you go straight off. The next is certainly the most difficult section of the circuit, up to 190 in places, and slightly blind before the White House corner. Now here's White House. We've gone accelerating now, all the way up to the new chicane that slows us right down to 50 miles an hour or so before the pits. On the second lap, you may change your braking technique a bit, but you've got to get it right first time, otherwise you just won't come round again. Usually it all begins in April, unless there's an earthquake or similar inconvenience to motor racing enthusiasts. April is practice time, 1968 being no exception, although the actual race came in September instead of June. For the superbly organized professional teams, as for all the entrants, it is more than practice time. It is time to test all the innovations and justify all the hard work that has gone into building entirely new cars or improving existing ones since the last race. For the private entry, and those with less liberal financial support, practice time may also appear to be the time to build a quick car in the paddock with any parts that come to hand. But the Le Mans 24 hours is a bit like the Grand National. It's not always the favorite that wins, or even survives. This car will both qualify and race.
All teams must ensure the efficiency of their brakes. Here, the Swiss-entered Ferrari of Scuderia Filippinetti prepares to bed in disc pads with a couple of gentle laps and to ensure correct brake mechanism adjustment. Alto Delta of Italy are here too, of course, with a usual strong entry, four two-litre Alphas. The Alphas are using the recently developed Ferodo Formula 2-4 disc pad. They're expecting a longer lease of life from each set of pads. That could mean perhaps two instead of three pad changes during the 24 hours, and that much time saved. But a lot will depend on the technique of each individual driver. 50 of the 54 starters <coughs> in the 1968 Le Mans race will rely on Ferodo. And of these, all but the Alphas are sticking to the well-proven Ferodo DS11, which shows that it sometimes takes time for a new product to supersede an already successful one. Thank you, Lord. Judging by the past and present performance, the works Porsches are likely to be the favourites for this race. Commentators, journalists and personalities of the world of motor racing gather to observe and comment. Then, sometimes all too soon, it is race time and the moment of truth draws near. In the picturesque towns and villages round Le Mans, the racing teams establish their headquarters. Drivers try to relax in an atmosphere of tension when talk is always of technical problems and tactics. There's Lucien Bianchi, who drive a Ford GT40 for John Wire, and his co-driver, Rodriguez, with the experience of many Le Mans races behind him. Jackie Oliver there, another GT40 driver, catching a few moments alone just 24 hours before the many hours of ultimate loneliness at the wheel. The drivers of two privately entered Fords there, Mike Salmon on the right and Berlis with the dark glasses. John Wire keeping a watchful eye as the final touches are put to the three GT40s in the Gulf Oil colours. All lessons learned from the April practice have been applied and battle will soon be joined with the works Porsches and the rest of the field. Race day now and the paddock at the track comes to life. The identification numbers on the works Porsches and all the cars are their racing numbers. No more practice now. This is the real thing. An American entry, number 23, a Halmet experimental turbine with its unmistakable jet wine. And another Halmet there, both unknown quantities in this, the world's greatest motor race. And that's Bob Tullius there, who'll be driving one of the turbines, the most revolutionary of all the American entries. The works Porsche's lining up now, 31 to 34. And the girls, too, are out in force with advertising matter on their backs, which is perhaps the wrong side. The show is really about to begin. Interviewers and interviewees are everywhere. And the television and radio boys are out in force, both on the track and above it. There's no doubt that the works Porsches are hot favourites for this race. There's Siffert in the windsheeter, co-driver of works Porsche number 31, preparing for that famous Le Mans start, where the drivers sprint across the track and into the car and start it on the button. And there's co-driver Hans Hermann in the check jacket. The fine, clear morning that held such promise for at least a dry, sunny start has given way to cold and torrential showers. The Porsche team, with only minutes to go, have changed to wet-weather tyres, looking more than a little flustered for all their reputation for efficiency. And yes, John Wire's Fords are changing too, and looking much calmer about it, even if they're not feeling it, so close to the start. Brian Muir there, making sure everything is set for a quick getaway. And now, with so very little time to go, it's over to the Press Tribune for an on-the-spot commentary of the start. The light is very poor indeed and the track heavy with water. And I can see Rodriguez there waiting under the umbrella, a real veteran of Le Mans. The drivers are just beginning to take up their positions opposite the pits now on the side of the track, away from the cars, of course, a track which must be as slippery as an ice cream. By my watch, there can't be more than a minute and a half to go before the three o'clock start, instead of the traditional four o'clock. The gruelling 24 hours will soon begin. 
The rain still coming in short, sharp bursts, soaking most of the spectators with nothing for protection but their enthusiasm. The sound of the crowd now down to a subdued, expectant murmur of French rhubarb. And they're off, no, is that a false start? No, they're off, the flag is down, and all the drivers are quickly out of the cars. The more powerful cars will try to get away first, so it's not too far down in the flag. And it's a Porsche away there first. Super, number 31, but 24 hours is a long time. And the match is away, Mitten. Porsche number 32 next, tail sliding under power on the wet surface. And the two other work Porsches are away, and the Fords now, near number 11, just away, but hemmed in a bit by the rest. But they're all moving now, and for once, no one left sweating at the start, napping his back. The spread of the visibility for the drivers must be close to nil. In less than four minutes, the leaders will pass the pits for the first time. And in less than half that time, with the slur cars already way behind, they'll be at Mulsan Corner, after getting up to more than 200 miles an hour, even in this weather on the straight. So, over now to Mulsan. Here at Mulsan, in sunshine now, we expect the leaders over the brow at any second. And there they are. And it's a works Porsche, and another, in a cloud of spray. And yes, yet another. That's three works Porsches, water streaming off the track. No others yet. But yes, it's still another Porsche, not a Ford in sight. It's Porsches one, two, three, and four, slowing down now for the corner. Not a Ford in sight. And back at the base, we've heard that Meres's Ford has already crashed on the Mulsan Strait. But first through the pits, it's still the works Porsche. One, two, three, and four, with Stommela in number 33, leading from Sippert in number 31. No signs of the GT40s or the Matra. In fifth place, it's the Alpha, 39. But Mauro Bianchi's Alpine, number 27, is sixth. Then the Swiss Ferrari. And yes, at last, two of John Wire's Ford GT40. Here in 11, followed, almost lost in the spray there, by Rodriguez in number nine. There's the Matra, the French favourite, already coming into the pits after only one lap. Looking towards the S's now, I can see Mauro Bianchi's Alpine going well away, followed by Brian Muir's Ford, already past the Ferrari and in seventh place. Then there's a bit of a gap, and it's Ford number nine next. Driving conditions must be terrible there. And there's Ford number ten, now lying tenth. Second time through the pits now, and it's still the works Porsches in the first four places, but spreading out more. And we've just heard that the Matra only has windscreen wiper trouble, although that could make driving impossible today. The leading Alpine has troubles too, but the other two Fords have closed up behind here into seventh and eighth position. But back again to Eric Tobit at Mulsan. Much better conditions now at Mulsan, and the works Porsches, after beginning to lap the tailenders on the third lap, are on lap four, still well ahead, but going carefully on this wet and slippery corner. Number 31, after taking the lead, is going particularly well. And Bizetta in number 34 has taken the escape road to tour. Bizetta off the circuit, no harm, but he could lose his fourth place to one of the fours. Muir has already passed the Alpha and is now lying fifth. The rest are going past now. And Bizetta has slipped in there just ahead of Muir in number 11. And the other two fours are right behind. So all John Wiles GT40s are together, fifth, sixth and seventh. Now back to Robin Richards. The Matra is back in the race now, somewhere out on the circuit and pulling up hard. So with the Fords pressing hard on the works Porsches, they're not going to have it all their own way. It's still anyone's race with a long, long way to go. On the fifth lap now, with the other two GT40s close behind, it's still Muir in number 11 threatening Gazetta's fourth position. But on the sixth lap, he's surprisingly dropped to the back of the trio behind Rodriguez in number nine. But he's done it. He's done it. Yes, Rodriguez in number nine, now in fourth position after seven laps. He's got ahead of Busetta's Porsche. But for every triumph at Le Mans, there's more than one tragedy. Right across the track from the press tribune, I can see the unfortunate Jean Max with the Moinet Simca, number 54, just about exhausted after pushing the car up the pit road from way out in the country where his oil pump packed up. The rules of this race are complicated enough for a lull of study. But two points at least are abundantly clear. The driver must get his car back to the pit unaided, and the car must start on the button. Only refreshments, cheers and sympathy are allowed until the pit is reached. Even then, disqualification is possible, or the fault may prove irreparable. But meanwhile, Ford number 10 has gone into the pits after eight laps for a tyre change, leaving the three leading works Porsches to be chased by Rodriguez in number nine. 
Brian Muir in number 11 is back in fifth place after finally passing Busetti's portion. Now on lap 12 with Rodriguez Bianchi Ford number 9 way back after the tyre changes, only the Muir Oliver Ford number 11 is on the same map as the leaders with Hobbs and Hawkins in number 10 coming up fast. And Brian Muir's gone onto the sand at Mulsanne and that looks like a long job to get that one off. That'll have put the works Porsches back into all the first four positions with, I should think, the Umtis Alpha number 39 back into fifth place and the three litre Alpine number 29 at sixth. Gregory's Ferrari, number 14, is 7th with a Lola and another Ferrari, 8th and 9th. So, no Fords with the leaders at the moment. It's 5 o'clock now and there have been plenty of changes. Two works Porsches still lead, but the Rodriguez Bianchi Ford, number 9, has come right up into third place on the same lap as Vic Elford in the second Porsche. Same lap is the Hawkins and Hobbs GT40 in fourth place, and the Busetta Patrick Porsche number 34 has dropped back to fifth. T shaped Alpine number 29 is sixth, and 14, Gregory's Ferrari is seventh. The Umtis Alpha number 39 has dropped back to eighth, but Pescarolo's Matra is showing again and is up to ninth position. Dusk at Le Mans. The lights of the survivors take over from the setting sun. Four of the 24 hours have not yet passed, but the leaders have covered some 60 laps more than 500 miles. For the cars, 20 hours to go. For the drivers, 11 hours of total darkness, supported by the sleepless technical night watch at the pit. It is a fine night. 200,000 spectators ebb and flow in the darkness, enjoying the attractions around the circuit and the carnival atmosphere of the fairground that lasts for just this one special night every year. By midnight, the entertainments are in full swing, but only 38 of the 54 starters remain, with 15 hours still to go. Ford number 9 is in the lead, but only two laps ahead of the French Hope, the Matra number 24. The Porsches are in trouble. Surrounded by the utter blackness of the small hours, life in the oasis of brilliance at the fairground dies slowly as the pleasure seekers begin to seek rest. The renewed rain dampens their spirits and combines with the darkness to increase the hazards of the track. By 1 a.m. the position has dramatically changed. Three of the four works Porsches have failed, but so have all but one of John Wyer's GT40s, although number nine is still clinging to the lead with the Matra lying second. Alpha number 39 is in third place, but the surviving works Porsche after dropping back to ninth with technical trouble is coming up fast. It is still anyone's race. 2 a.m. and Ford number 9 still leads from the Matra with the Alpha third, but Porsche number 33 has regained fourth position. By 2.30 the rain is torrential. Visibility for the drivers is appalling and by 3 a.m. a total of 20 cars have fallen by the wayside, some literally. In the cold, dark, open-fronted concrete pits, managers and mechanics stand ready for brief flurries of essential activity and meanwhile plot the progress of the remaining cars.
By 5 a.m. in the darkest hours before the dawn, the leaders have completed 200 laps, but 22 cars have gone. It feels unlikely that the sun can ever rise again. Dawn has not actually broken at Le Mans. Rather, there has been a weakening of the darkness. It is cold and damp and autumnal. The rain has stopped, but drying out would take time. Life returns slowly to the area by the track known as the village, where all the facilities of a holiday town are available to the wakening and returning spectators. The melancholy air of the deserted fairground has yet to be dispelled by the enthusiasm of racegoers returning to find their favourites well placed. As yet, there is little sign of movement in the usually teeming areas about the track. Only the surviving cars press resolutely on. John Wyer's Ford number no. 9 has survived the night and is leading from the Alpha number no. 39, with the Matra lying third and challenging strongly for second place, already gained and lost in the hours of darkness. Right up now in fourth place is the Swiss Porsche number no. 66. The only surviving works Porsche is fifth and gaining. By 8 o'clock, village life is returning to normal as a fitful sun dries the track and, together with coffee, cognac and the news that the matter is again second, raises the hopes of the predominantly French crowd. By 9 o'clock, the Matra lying second is only six laps behind the Ford and closing the gap. The Alpha on the same lap is in third position. Behind the Swiss and Works Porsches in sixth place lies the Alpine Renault 27. Then come two more Alphas, seventh and eighth, and David Piper's Ferrari ninth. Lying 10th is the 2-litre French entered Porsche number 45. Then in 11th position, another 3-litre Alpine with another Alpine number 57, 12th. At Le Mans, 32 cars are out of the race and the day is still young. Less than five hours to go now and Lucien Bianchi in the Ford still leads the 22 survivors. 100 laps and more than 800 miles separate the leaders from the last car. But only six laps behind the Ford lies the Matra, with, to the French crowd's delight, a commanding lead over Alpha number 39, though it's still in third place after a 22-minute unscheduled pit stop. Coming up fast are the Swiss Porsche, fourth, and the Works Porsche, number 33, fifth. Another Alpha, 38, is sixth. Mauro Bianchi in Alpine Renault 27 lies seventh. 25 laps behind his brother in the Ford, but still going strongly, and a contender for one of the prizes awarded for performance or class after complicated calculations of efficiency. To say nothing of the possibility of finishing well up with the leaders, any or all of which could still fail to complete the 24 hours. But with hardly four hours left, Lucien Bianchi in the Ford passes the wreckage of the Alpine not knowing that his brother has survived the crash. The leaders, including the Matra, come through apparently unscathed, but the Matra has run over some of the Alpine wreckage, sustaining damage that eventually proves fatal. The French supporters will watch in vain for the return of their favourite. Just one hour to go now. Alpha number 39 has unexpectedly dropped to fourth place, but two other team Alphas are fifth and sixth. 17 laps separate Alphas 39 and 40, with 38 somewhere in the middle. Most surprising of all, the Swiss Porsche number 66 has come right up into second place, two laps ahead of the Works Porsche and hard on the heels of the Ford. But the one surviving Works Porsche is still closing on the two leaders and has moved up dramatically from fifth and then fourth into third place. Signs of the strain that must be affecting all the survivors with most of the 24 grueling hours behind them show clearly during the inevitable pit stop. 
only minutes to go now, so over to the pits for the finale of what is undoubtedly the world's toughest motor race. An expectant hush has fallen over the densely packed tribute. John Wire's Ford number nine passes the pits area for the last time. Before completing another lap, the chequered flag will be raised and this punishing race will have been won for the third time running by a Ford car. And thanks to John Wire, this means the World Manufacturer Sports Car Championship goes to Fords for the first time. The championship that would otherwise have gone to the Porsche. At the pits now, the flag is already out, with the winning car still out on the circuit. But it's the distance covered in the 24 hours that counts. And without a shadow of doubt, that means the Ford. It's the car of Rodriguez and Bianchi that the crowd most wants to welcome. Meanwhile, finishing in second place, there's Sporty and Steinemann's Swiss Porsche, number 66. The one surviving works Porsche, number 33, takes third place, with the splendid trio of Alphas in line astern there, fourth, fifth and sixth. And that's David Piper's Ferrari now, number 21, having finished seventh. And there, at last, it is. Number nine, the Ford, the GT40, and a really rousing welcome for drivers Belgian Lucien Bianchi and Mexican Pedro Rodriguez, for whom winning at Le Mans is also the fulfilment of an ambition of a lifetime. A triumph for JW Automotive Engineering. The winning Ford has completed 330 laps, more than 2,700 miles in 24 hours, maintaining an average speed of over 115 miles an hour despite torrential rain during the extra hours of darkness and the need to brake hard an extra 330 times for the new chicane before the pit. <laughs> 